Our traditional greeting is Tiskub and Hamasiyon. And uh, it's five o'clock in the afternoon. And I have to confess to all of you that I had a completely different uh, share order prepared for uh, today. Um, and uh, this morning, everything that I kind of wanted to say was really thrown on its head. And I'll tell you why. I, I went to Shul. And we'll talk about it in a minute. So the Mishnah and Ta'ani tells us there's five things. I'm sure you've heard it a billion times today already. It's five o'clock. It's late. Um, that happens on Tisha B'Av. What are the five things? Number one is that uh, the Jewish nation was poised to enter Israel in a couple of days. The whole thing would have been over. Instead, the spies came back. Uh, Bad mouthed Israel. You all know the story. 40 years in the desert. The second and third thing the Mishnah lists is the destruction of the two temples on exactly the same date, a couple of hundred years apart. The fourth thing is the destruction of Beter, which was basically the, um, can somebody, can everybody mute themselves, please? There's somebody making a lot of background noise. Thank you. Uh, the destruction of Beter about 60 some odd years later after the Roman destruction. Uh, this was another Roman destruction, a second one. They destroyed Bar Kokhba and his rebellion. And uh, the fifth thing is that um, Hadrian, after the Bar Kokhba rebellion, plowed Jerusalem under with salt to make it completely uninhabitable. So now if we kind of bring all these five things together, right? The Meraglim, the Batem Mignash, Beter, the, dis the destruction of, of any agriculture or any kind of uh, habitation around Jerusalem, it really comes down to one thing. Tisha B'Av is a commemoration of us being prevented from living in our country as a sovereign nation. Whether it was God saying you can't go in, whether it was Bavel destroying the Beit HaMikdash and our national sovereignty, the Romans doing the same thing twice, or whether it was Hadrian completely, made, even if we are there, you can't even, I don't even make it, uh, uh, easy to live there. Whatever it was, this was a prevention of us living in our country. Now, the ensuing 2,000 years have not been kind to the land of Israel. I want to read you uh, in English one of the keynote we read from this morning. And it was written in the middle of the 12th century by uh, David ben Pakuda. And Abid David ben Pakuda wrote the following. The curtain and the circuit of heaven trembled, and a cloud dwelled upon me, and all the shining lights, the sun and the moon, were darkened on the day that the city, once great among the nations, became like a widow, and the faithful were crushed to the ground and languished. Therefore, I lament bitterly every year. How has the city, once full of judgment, become as a harlot? The fairest of sights, joy of all the earth, the city where the people of Israel dwelled has become a waste and a desolation, a proverb and a mockery, and all her inhabitants sigh. They found no mercy. That's a description of Yerushalayim in the 12th century. Let's fast forward uh, some years. And I want to read you a description of, of the whole of Palestine, really, from Mark Twain. He made a visit there in 1867. And his, uh, his uh, tourist brochure did not come out very nice in favor of Israel. Of all the lands there are for dismal scenery, I think Palestine must be, must be the prince. Renowned Jerusalem itself, the stateliest name in history, has lost all its ancient grandeur. It has become a pauper village. The riches of Solomon are no longer there to compel the admiration of visiting Oriental queens. The wonderful temple, which was the pride and glory of Israel, is gone. Palestine is desolate and unlovely. And why should it be otherwise? Palestine is no more to the workday world. It is sacred to poetry and tradition. It is a dreamland. Well, it was actually very accurate, that description of the land of Israel. 
but things are about to change. Um, from the 1860s on into the 1880s, we started to have a lot of migration. Uh, the famous Zionist narrative is the first Aliyah of, of Jews from Russia came, but in that same year, in 1881, uh, many people don't know, 100,000 Yehudim came. Uh, a brilliant young professor gave me this, is Dr. Murray Mizrahi. Um, a uh, 100,000 Jews came from Morocco and from Yemen that same year. So the land was beginning to change. It took some time. It took about 70 more years until there was, the Jews got independence and things began to open up and to flourish. But when we look at 1948, most of our uh, parents, grandparents, or great-grandparents, depending on your age, decided not to go there. They decided that they were much better places on earth to live. And they probably um, were not wrong. They probably were right. Israel had uh, a lot of hardship in those uh, beginning years, a lot of hardship. The 1950s, there was a joke that so many people had gone to Israel and were leaving. They said, well, the last one out in the airport, please shut the lights off. It was a very difficult place to live in. Uh, Israel was not only under the constant threat of war, but also economically. It was inferior to, to many, many places that the Jews had opened to them uh, in the world. But how have things changed? Things have changed in that today Israel is a vacation destination. Uh, we go there for leisure. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And those descriptions that we saw, um, I'm gonna try and share a screen now, but those descriptions that, that we looked at uh, really just don't apply anymore. Anywhere you go in Jerusalem, anywhere, okay? You have these magnificent, magnificent shots, right? It doesn't look so desolate. It doesn't look so barren anymore. And this was a, you know, a simple, um, just looking at things on my computer today, right? Just, I, I typed in Israel scenery and these beautiful, beautiful things came up. And it really was um, amazing. Now, what, what's, am what's really amazing is, is that there are no laws anymore preventing you from being part of this. There are no armies. There are no uh, um, overlords that we have to answer to there. Uh, it's a Jewish country. And it's our country. Now, what's really amazing is, is that there are still a great amount of Jews that live outside of Israel. Um, echoing Rabbi Madelon's class this morning, it may not be as many as we think. And those of you who know me have heard me say this a million times. You know, the number they quote all the time of 5.3 or 5.7 million Jews, I don't really buy that number at all. There are so, so, so many millions of Jews in the United States that don't identify as Jews anymore at all. And those of us who remain faithful, we have an obligation to keep our eyes open. If we um, were to talk about Tisha B'Av this year, talk about anything really, and avoid speaking about what happened this spring, it would almost be unreal, unrealistic for sure. So many of our lives were upended and changed um, from business to the way we attend synagogue or don't attend synagogue, the way that we uh, teach, the way that we learn, everything. Uh, I remember at uh, Yeshiva Flapush, you know, uh, a day, two days before we shut down everything, they brought all the teachers in for an emergency meeting to teach us how to use Zoom. I was completely, I had no idea what it even was. And all of a sudden it became the centerpiece of everything I was doing. My morning classes, my night classes. Uh, I finished Shas this, this year with my, my group of Mishnayot uh, men in the morning. We finished it on, on Zoom. Right, so it became a part of life, this, this format that we're all looking at right now. We're not in, in, the, uh, in the J this year, 700 people sitting and listening to the speeches. We're on, we're on this computer. Life changed. And then all of a sudden, there were these riots that started happening all over the United States. We all watched it on TV or saw it in our cities or whatever, wherever we are. And there's no uh, question about it. But the United States, as a country, is undergoing some very fundamental changes. And um, as Jews, we have to keep our eyes open. And um, 
when we don't, uh, historically, any time we haven't, we, we have done so to our peril. And we need to keep our eyes open and we need to look at that 24-7, 365 day a year news cycle. And uh, the truth is that it's not such great news that this once uh, amazing country that we call the United States is changing and it's, it's tectonic and you can feel the plates right under your feet. Um, we all saw it uh, several weeks ago and they were tearing down statues of Abraham Lincoln, tearing down statues of, of George Washington. Uh, these are people that I grew up as a kid, you know, pledging allegiance to and to a flag. And uh, now it's, it's all being upended by uh, large groups of people. Um, who would have imagined uh, even two years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that there would be four members of Congress who would be openly anti-Semitic, two of which are practicing Muslims that are openly anti-Israel, openly anti-Semitic. And what's even more amazing than that is, is that their party refuses to admonish them. Totally refuses. And the squad, as they call them now, is only four people. What happens when it's eight? What happens when it's 12? What happens when it's 50? You know, many, many people um, always ask me a question and they say, why didn't the Jews in Europe leave when they saw what was going on? They saw the storm gathering. How did they not leave? And everybody wants to play Monday morning quarterback. And the truth of the matter is, is that the Jews of Germany itself did leave. Um, in 1933, when Hitler assumed power, there were 600,000 Jews in what we call Germany proper. 600,000. By the eve of the war, 1939, there were only 300,000. Half of them did leave. Unfortunately, they went to France, they went to Poland, they never expected that the Germans would attack or expand or succeed in the way that they did, unfortunately. But they did leave. They heeded the message. They listened to a man who was democratically elected in a democratic republic in the middle of Europe in the most civilized place in the world. And it happened. So what happens when the politics over here turn on us? We can't just rationalize it away. I know this may offend some people, and I apologize, but not really. Um, the BLM movement, if anyone has looked at their... At their um, at their manifesto closely. It's really frightening. They are openly anti-Semitic, openly anti-Israel, and many, many, many people uh, poo-poo this, right? And they say, oh, it's just a fringe, uh, you know, part of the movement. That never worked well for us either, right? They're also against things like the nuclear family, which are definitely Jewish values, or some people call them Judeo-Christian values. All right, these things are being torn away and our society is crumbling as we watch it. So what are we to do? What are we supposed to do about this? And the answer is that most of you have heard me say this again a billion times. Anyone who prays with me on Shabbat heard my sermons and sometimes just shakes their heads and says, oh, here he goes again, All right? We have a place to go today. Jerusalem is no longer desolate. It's no longer downtrodden. The people are not under the thumb of the nations, right? right? All the prayers and all these kinot that we're saying, they're fading because history is marching forward. And this morning, I, I changed what I was going to do today. I was actually going to go through uh, Yehezkel's vision of the dry bones, which I have done before uh, with larger groups and talk about the Geula, but something absolutely just rocked me. And that was that I was sitting next to my son-in-law. My son-in-law lives in Yerushalayim. My daughter and, and, uh, and their family are here visiting for a little while now. And my son-in-law um, kind of looked at me and he said, I just can't relate to this, to these prayers. Jerusalem is not desolate. My daughter and her family live on this beautiful uh, in this beautiful apartment on a tree-lined street in a beautiful neighborhood in Jerusalem. And to say that we're downtrodden and, and the city is destroyed and in a shambles and there are foreign armies marching across us and killing our women and bayoneting our babies, they're not anymore. They're not. 
thank God, we have a place to go. We have something to do. We can take action. And the big question is, is while we're fasting, and while we're all uncomfortable, and while we're sitting here during the Tisha'a Be'av, are we going to take action? Are we going to do something about it? Or do these prayers, do everything we say, mean absolutely nothing? And nothing more than the price of the paper they're printed on. Because this is a call to action. Our rabbis for 2,000 years have been calling us to action. You can't open Sefer Devarim without getting some sort of move to Israel message. You can't open our Pismoni books behind me. Our rabbis were fervently, fervently lovers of Sion. And how do we, how do we live with ourselves today and not take up God's biggest challenge? And the question we all have to ask ourselves at the end of Tisha B'Av is the questions we ask ourselves at Ni'ila and Yom Kippur as the day is fading. As it's after Hasor, the people, some people say, you know, the Sefaradim don't hold that, but we usually, after Minha, the Abbe Lut goes down, but we're approaching Minha now. Things are winding down. What are we going to take away from this Tisha B'Av? Another speech about Sanat Hinam? Another speech about why the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed. Another speech about how we're suffering. There's a million of them. I've given a lot of them. But we need to ask ourselves very sincerely and very clearly, and every man and every woman has their own answer to this question. And that is, do we sit by and watch history unfold, or do we become active participants in that history? Now, it's not simply playing football or watching the game. For Jews, it's been much different. It's not only play the game or sit in the stands. It's play the game or get slaughtered. That's what it's been traditionally. So how do we take a, pre -act, a proactive role? What do we do? And again, there's a million answers to that question. A million. There's a thousand ways to slice it. Do you want to buy property in Israel? Do you want to invest in someone's project? Do you want to do business there? Do you want to visit more often? Do you want to buy more Israeli products? Whatever it is, whatever your level of commitment is, get involved with the Geula. Get involved with it because it's happening. You know, there's two uh, approaches. Um, again, my son was very active in showing me this as well to how the Geulah is going to come about. There's the one that's based upon the Gemara with, that she comments on, that it's going to be a, a, an amazing fireworks event where the third Beit HaMikdash is going to descend from the heavens on the Temple Mount. But the other approach, which has been taken by most of our rabbis for the past 2,000 years, is that it's going to develop gradually. And I think that you have to be blind or you have to be someone who just runs away from the truth, to not look at what's going on today and say, we are in the middle of the Geula. The process has begun. It's here, it's now, and it's happening. And there's been a paradigm shift. And that shift has been that the, the, the largest Jewish community in the world, the most effective, the most important, important Jewish community of all time was the Jews of the United States of America. Ladies and gentlemen, there has been a shift. And that shift has gone to the state of Israel. I believe that the majority of Jews now live in the state of Israel. And there's all kinds of issues of halakha that that affects. But it's not only halakha. It's also the way we look at the world. The Rambam, in Hilchot Melachim, chapter 12, quotes the uh, Gemara in Perek and Omdin in, in, in Berachot. And it says, in ben, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know if I have to quote it, but he said, there's no difference between Yemot HaMashiach and our times, except for Shi'abud Malchuyot, our subjugation to the nations. And ladies and gentlemen, that Shi'abud is no longer here. We are in the period of Mashiach. We are here. That the, the man on the white donkey, we missed him. 
he has a small apartment somewhere in Ramoth today. It's, it's happened. It's happened. And right before our very eyes. We have to think about those prayers, think about those kinot that have been uttered for 2,000 years. And we have to end our day by saying in a very loud voice, in a very serious voice, in a very sincere voice, the Shana Haba'a Bi Yerushalayim Amen. Thank you very much.